Welcome to the Beast Rider family where social media engagement is encouraged. I am your host, Ryan Sakamoto, and today we are going to be making sense of the Kansas City Chiefs trading for offensive tackle Orlando Brown Jr. Now, before we go ahead and do that, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for subscribing to my channel. Just be sure to turn on and flip on the bell notifications so you get notified when I go live or when I upload content. Also, I'm looking at my analytics and I'm seeing 73% of you guys are liking all my stuff, watching all my videos, but have yet to subscribe to my channel. So please do me a solid and hit the subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen as you stay up to date on all things Beast in real time. Another reason why you want to do that is because you score free prizes every 2, 3 p.m. on Friday on our live stream. So you can't go wrong with that, right? Who doesn't like free stuff? All right, so let's go ahead and get into this particular podcast as it pertains to Orlando Brown Jr. For those who are new to subscribing, To my podcast, I like to break down all my podcasts in simplest form, and those are based on three parameters. The first parameter is who are the players or coaches involved. The second parameter is why the moves made or potentially could be made. And the last but not least parameter is the instant gratification versus long-term gains. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about this blockbuster deal as it pertains to Orlando Brown Jr. Let me go ahead and pull up these tickers. I know you guys love these tickers. All right, so the trade alert, we just touched base on this. I think the ticker's up. Yeah, Orlando Brown Jr. was traded to the Kansas City Chiefs in exchange for a multiple uh, number of draft picks. I'm going to go ahead and break that down brick by brick. So in this deal, this is what we're looking at. All right, the Chiefs get left tackle Orlando Brown Jr., a 2021 second round pick, number 58 overall in the second round in this year's upcoming draft, as long with a 2022 future six round pick from the Baltimore Ravens in exchange the Baltimore Ravens receive a plethora of picks so GM Eric DeCosta is now rolling the dice and really gaining draft capital something that he learned from Ozzy Newsome and he got good value so I'm going to touch base on why Orlando Brown Jr. requested a trade in the first place and why the Ravens ultimately had no choice but to trade their pro bowl left tackle or right tackle however you see fit so the Ravens in return giving up their Pro Bowl offensive tackle, yield a 2021 first-round pick, number 31 overall in the tail end of the first round. That is huge. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in-depth in this podcast. They also yield a 2021 third-round pick, number 94. They also yield a fourth-round pick, number 136, and a future 2022 fifth-round pick. So that's four draft picks and definitely assets in the Ravens favor. Now you also have to look at it with a grain of salt and look at the flip side of that. And the Kansas city chiefs also won this deal. So it's a win-win in my opinion, but we're going to go ahead and talk about the first parameter. Now that we've broken down the trade as to who is Orlando Brown jr. Right. Who is Orlando Brown jr. We just went ahead and talked about the Ravens getting four draft picks, which is huge for them. I'm going to, I mean, it's listen, there's a reason why the Baltimore Ravens are at the top of their game every year and draft season is no different so let's go ahead and talk about orlando brown jr well who is orlando brown jr right well he he was the ravens 2018 third round pick draft number 83 overall out of oklahoma if you remember gm eric DeCosta has an affinity for oklahoma players he drafted players like marquise hollywood brown along with some other players out of oklahoma so he does love oklahoma players he even admitted to that in earlier press conferences so with that being said he was drafted by the baltimore ravens He was not a workout warrior. You know, when the combine and the pro days were hitting, well, this year it's only been pro days, but when the pro days been hitting, everyone talks about the, oh, the workout warrior numbers. Oh, these are great numbers. Oh, let's shoot them up the draft board. No, 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 no. That's not the Baltimore Ravens MO, which is why they selected Orlando Brown Jr. Why am I bringing this up? Well, he, as an Orlando Brown Jr., did not fare so well when it came to the workout warrior numbers. In fact, he had a 10-yard split of two seconds, which is the slowest of any offensive lineman, which ranked dead last. He also ranked dead last in the bench press with 18. Um, When you are as big as Orlando Brown Jr. is at 345 pounds plus, and you're only benching 18 reps of 225, which is uh, a little less than your body weight, well, I guess you say a little bit more than a little bit. It's more, it's definitely... How should I say this? At 345, he's benching 18 reps. At 150, I can bench 22 reps of 225. So the functional strength was, eh, get my point. All right, that ranks dead last. His vertical jump, 
ranked dead last for all offensive linemen with a 25 and a, uh, and a half inch vertical jump. And his broad jump was 89 inches, which ranked dead last. So all these numbers rank dead last for offensive linemen. However, the game film doesn't lie. And that's the number one indicator when you come out of the Baltimore Ravens scouting department is that's the thing that they look for. Ultimately, Orlando Brown Jr. shine. And as a result, he hit, a, hit his Pro Bowl season in stride in 2020, filling in for Ronnie Stanley, who went down to a gruesome ankle injury. And ultimately, I believe that was week 12 or something like that uh, early on in the year against the Pittsburgh Steelers. So if you guys remember that game, uh, Ronnie Stanley went down the, the Ravens blindside left tackle that forced um, Orlando Brown Jr. to go ahead and shift over to the left side. And that really did wonders for that Baltimore Ravens offense. And as you know, left tackle money is more important than right tackle money. And we all saw that with Trent Williams. So let's go ahead and talk about my next parameter. Why was the move made? Well, like I said, Orlando Brown Jr. was disgruntled in Baltimore. He wanted left tackle money. I mean, you look at what I just said, left tackle Trent Williams. What do you get? $23 million. David Bakhtiari, what does he get annual per year? $23 million. What does Laramie Tunsil get? $22 million per year. What does his own teammate, Ronnie Stanley, who plays blindside left tackle, get? $19.7 million per year. So when you break it down, the top four salaries for blindside left tackles is significantly higher than the right tackle market. Take that a step further, peeling back another layer of the onion to get to the core, as I always like to say, okay, let's hear some food for thought. Put that in perspective. The next guy, well, in terms of top five left tackle money is Colton Miller from the Las Vegas Raiders, who has just rewarded 18 million per year annually. That is the market for the right tackle money at the highest paid for that position, which in turn becomes who? Lane Johnson from the Philadelphia Eagles at $18 million, who plays what? Right tackle. Then you take it a step further. There's a steep decline from Lane Johnson down below. And the next guy in line for that is Jack Conklin from the Cleveland Browns. He gets $14 million per year annually. So when you do the math, you can see why Orlando Brown Jr. is not happy about playing right tackle as opposed to left tackle. Because again, for those who don't know, I just said he was a 2018 third round pick. So they're not going to pick up the fifth year option if he was on the Baltimore Ravens because he doesn't have one. He's not a first round draft pick, meaning he's playing in a contract year. So there's no guarantee that he'd be given a contract extension with Baltimore with Ronnie Stanley already guarding left tackle money. So you see the log jam there. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the Kansas City Chiefs. Why did they go ahead and make a trade for this disgruntled blindside left tackle? Well, if you remember, they released Eric Fisher. They released right tackle Mitchell Shorts. Uh, and so they had a need for an offensive tackle. When you're sitting there at number 31, logically, what's going to be there in the tail end of the first round? You look at guys like Samuel Cosme, maybe Tevin Jenkins out of Oklahoma State. Uh, these are the types of guys that would be there. Orlando Brown Jr. is definitely head and shoulders above better than them. So with that being said, credit to GM Brett Veach for go ahead and making this deal. Because at the end of the day, you get a Pro Bowl left tackle at a fraction of the price of what it would take to reach for a, a blindside left tackle in the tail end of the first round. So that's a win for the Kansas City Chiefs side. Now take it a step further. They then doubled down on that. They signed offensive guard, or should I say left guard, Joe Tooney, stealing him from the New England Patriots, inking him to the largest left guard money contract with a five-year, $80 million deal. With that being said, you now turn the left side of the offensive line into a strength because now you have Joe Tooney, and now you team up with Orlando Brown Jr. That could arguably be a top five left side uh duo in the NFL. Now take it a step further. Who'd they bring out of retirement? They brought it, they brought back Kyle Long, who was a Pro Bowl player in his own right back in 2014. So when you take that into account, now you have Joe Tooney. Now you have Kyle Long on the interior. And then you have Orlando Brown Jr. And now Kansas City Chiefs fans and Chiefs Kingdom is excited and ecstatic because GM Brett Veach does it again and takes a weakness and quickly turns it into a strength. And using his magician magic powers and yielding one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. Now, Kyle Long has been out of football for so many years. However, if he can regain that muscle memory, which I talked about with the fitness gains, that will come into play and he could arguably be, be a steal in free agency and in this draft class. So again, credit for Brett Veach, Brett Veach, excuse me, for going ahead and swinging this deal. Now, let's go ahead at what the Ravens, why the Ravens made this move, right? Why did the Ravens make this move? 
as the second part of the second parameter. Well, GM Eric DeCosta learns for GM Ozzy Newsom that draft flexibility is of the utmost importance. That's how you build teams from the inside out, not the outside in. So he gains draft flexibility in the first round. If you remember, now this leverages that what they can do on day one because they have multiple first round picks. If you remember what I said in my earlier live streams, that teams will logically like to trade up in the tail end of the first round to get that coveted player. So don't be surprised if the Ravens trade back for one of those two players in the tail end of the first round and gain more draft capital because GM Eric DeCosta knows value when he sees it. And if there's a player in the tail in the first, like if Najee Harris starts to slide, if Javante Williams is a player that teams say, hey, let's go up and get him because he's not going to be around by 43 when the Niners are on the clock. Or a guy like Michael Carter, someone like that. Don't be surprised if there's a team that's willing to trade up in the tail in the first round for a running back, for a cornerback like Asante Samuel, for one of these players that are going to fly off the board in the top five picks of the second round in order to secure that they got that they want in day two. So that's why I think it's a very good draft position and hotspot for a trade for the Baltimore Ravens. Now, if they so choose, because let's look at their needs, right? They have the number 27th overall pick and they also hold the 31st pick overall. What are their needs? They have offensive guard, center, defensive end, inside linebacker, outside linebacker, and free safety. At number 27, I currently have them taking defensive end Christian Barmore. Now, Christian Barmore is a specific scheme fit for that defense coming from Alabama. You guys know I'm a huge Roll Tide fan, but he comes from the 34 base defense. To me, he's a top interior defensive lineman who can play the 3-4 defensive end position. Again, Calais Campbell's contract is coming up for renewal, so we don't know if he's going to be re-signed. There's a lot of unknowns there. He could be, even be a cap casualty. So with that being said, not this year, obviously, but... It's someone that something to think about as the team moves forward. Then at 31, you can leverage that draft pick how you see fit. You can gain more draft pick. You can possibly trade up. Who knows? They might want to see a player, use those multiple first round picks, trade up back into the first round, even go higher, or they can stay pat. So there's a lot of different options that the team can move in. Ultimately, if they were to trade back from 31 or stay pat at 31, whatever they do with that draft pick and how they leverage that draft pick, it's ultimately going to be an offensive center. Do not be surprised if that guy is Landon Dickerson from Alabama or Creed Humphrey from Oklahoma. All right. And again, the Ravens MO is to always go best player available because teams and while well, teams are being built from the inside out, not the outside in. That's been Baltimore Ravens GM Eric DeCosta's MO. Look for him to go that route. So again, this is a smart play for both sides. It's a win-win for both teams. I don't see any losers in making this deal. All right. And let, last but not least, we are going to go ahead and talk about the instant gratification versus long-term gains. Well, from the Chiefs perspective, they're targeting a left tackle at number three. And like I said, ultimately a guy who is mocked to be around at the pick number 31 when the Chiefs were holding that pick is Samuel Cosby, Tevin Jenkins, Alex Leatherwood, guys like that. I don't think those guys are as good as Orlando Brown Jr. That's why GM Brett Beach agrees and he went ahead and made this trade for a Pro Bowl blindside left tackle and that's why it's a win for the Chiefs just by saying that. Now, let's go ahead and look at the Ravens perspective, right? From the Ravens point of view, let's go ahead and break it down. I think, the, yeah, the instant gratification for long term is still up there. Okay, good. From Eric DeCosta's point of view, they wiped their hands clean of a player in the last year of his contract, right? A 2018 third round pick who's playing in the last year of his contract because he wasn't a first round pick, so there's no fifth year option to be rewarded. Orlando Brown Jr. with disgruntled one left tackle money. Well, that's not going to happen because Ronnie Stanley's coming back. So there's a log jam there. So you gain valuable draft capital in return. That is a smart play by GM Eric DeCosta, which is why I believe he's a top five GM in the NFL. This allows the Baltimore Ravens to now let the board talk to them in the tail in the first round. Again, it goes back to a lot of these teams are going to be vying for the tail in the first round, making power play moves for a guy who they want on day two, but ultimately want to hit the anxiety button and don't want to wait because they're not sure that that player is going to be on their board when they are on the clock, right? So in turn, they can leverage the number 31 pick as they see, as they see fit. Again, if they stay pat, or if they trade back, ultimately, I think they're going to leverage the number 31 overall pick that they just got from the Kansas City Chiefs to go ahead and land a center like Landon Dickerson or Creed Humphreys. Just calling it. Just calling it. All right. So that's pretty much for this podcast. Drop your comments and let's talk football. If you like my analysis and insights, be sure to hit the subscribe button in the lower right hand corner of your screen as you stay up to date on all things beast in real time. So drop your comments, Ravens fans, Chiefs fans. What are your thoughts? I love engaging with you on this platform. Please leave your comments. And again, welcome to the beast rider family. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. Take care. Beast Rider out. <laughs>